Hi, I'm Karen Magruder. I'm a clinical social worker and social work professor, and I'm a trained climate reality leader with the Climate Reality Project. And in this presentation, I want to share with you the growing field of green social work and why environmental justice issues should and do matter to social work practitioners and professionals and educators. Some key questions I'll be covering are, should social workers be involved in environmental issues, or is that just something for the uh, environmental science folks and sustainable technology and politicians to solve? What are the key ecological issues that are facing our society? Why is that a social justice issue? And what is the impact not on just all people, but also specifically on vulnerable and marginalized communities? And what can social workers do about it? First, why should you trust me to share this information with you? I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about my background. I worked in the community as a social worker in long-term care, and I saw firsthand how the environment, the physical environment and the natural environment really impacted the older adults that I was serving. For example, we saw that heat waves were becoming increasingly common and the nonprofit I worked with, The Senior Source, was increasingly doing drives to uh, get air conditioning units donated to help older adults be able to cope with the rising heat in the Dallas area where I live. Also, we see the increasing severity of hurricanes and how flooding and extreme weather events impact individuals, both in the community and specifically in long-term care what happens when they evacuate and how can we have continuity of care given that those disasters are going to continue to be even more of an issue in the future because of climate change. This really helped me to see that connection between the community that I was serving and those environmental issues and realize that even though I've always been interested in um, the environment and environmental issues, I really saw that connection between my social work practice and environmental issues. And so I wanted to educate myself and get more training about it. I was accepted and um, was a part of the Climate Reality Leadership Corps training uh, led by Al Gore, and so received a lot of great knowledge and skills um, from that program. I also earned a certificate in climate change and health from Yale, and it helped me again to see all these different connections specifically to vulnerable and marginalized populations. As a clinical therapist with my own private therapy practice, I'm starting to incorporate some ecotherapy approaches to my practice, and I'm also increasingly seeing, uh, either with my clients or individuals that I work with in the community, an increasing problem with stress and anxiety and grief related to climate issues. I'm actively engaged with my local Dallas-Fort Worth chapter of the Climate Reality Project and related community justice, community environmental justice efforts in the area. I've done some research, actually I have an article pending at the moment, uh, about a community-based intervention to educate the, the public and students about environmental issues and the impact on vulnerable communities. I teach, I teach an environmental justice and green social work course that I developed at the University of Texas at Arlington, and I served on the Council for Social Work Education's Environmental Justice Curriculum Development Task Force. So I'm continually wanting to learn and grow in this area, but I think I uh, have some wisdom that can be valuable as I share about this important topic. A note quickly on definitions. I may use some of these terms sort of interchangeably at times, but environmental often in the social work world refers not only to the natural environment, but also the built environment. So thinking about things like do individuals with disabilities uh, or different abilities have the ability to access um, public places and a lot of different things related to that. It's not just the natural world. Ecological tends to focus on the interdependence and relationship between humans, plants, animals, that we're all connected, and so I really like that. But I chose green for the name of this presentation and my course because I think green kind of encompasses both. When you think green, you think about the environmental movement and caring about the natural environment and how we're all impacted by that, but it also implies a 
call to action and that going green is something that it's not just theoretical, um, but it's actually learning about the issue and also doing something about it. And so I, I use green to encamp, encapsulate social justice practice um, that is focused on the environment and mostly the natural environment with some exceptions. So what does social work have to do with it? If you're a social worker, you're familiar with ecological systems theory and the person and environment perspective. In my social work education and practice, I really saw that for the most part, person and environment related to the person in the social environment, the political environment, the cultural environment, but not actually truly the physical and natural environment. And that plays a substantial role in our health and well-being. It's also highly connected to our social work core values outlined in the NASW Code of Ethics, specifically social justice. I encourage you to think about that lens as we go through the rest of this presentation, and also the dignity and worth of the person and service, very connected to these issues. You'll also see that environmental problems intersect with virtually all other social work issues and places where social workers already serve. Think about homelessness, working with refugees. There's a variety of different populations that you might serve who have been or will be impacted by environmental issues. And so having some of this awareness can help you integrate uh, this knowledge and, and skill base into your practice, even if you're not working directly in an environmental role. But we are seeing social workers working directly in environmental roles more so and more. A definition of environmental justice, this is um, from the EPA, they say environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So we're going to be focusing in this presentation mostly on the impacts, but I think it's very key to keep in mind as we move to solutions that it's not just are the burdens of environmental issues equally distributed or are they disproportionately impacting certain communities that already have these unfair you know, treatment, but also how are we actively empowering and involving everybody and bringing all voices to the table to come up with these solutions. So what are some of the current issues? You may have noticed when I started my key questions that I had an airplane, which I didn't explain at the time. The reason is that this is the 40,000 40, feet version of this information. I teach an entire class on this, and so I could get into a lot more detail about all of these things, but this is really just a sampler, a taste of what some of these issues are. So climate change is, in my opinion, the biggest environmental issue that is facing um, the social service industry. It's been named the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. Many different sources have seen it as a significant health issue, a significant um, issue related to national security. And 97% of climate scientists agree that this climate crisis is human caused. It's related to our emissions of greenhouse gases, and so we need to be a major part of the solution. And there are some great efforts underway to go towards that, but business as usual projections uh, say that we could go as high as 4.8 degrees Celsius of warming, which is well above the 1.5 um, maximum to be able to sustain our current lifestyle, and there's potentially catastrophic results as, uh, as a result of that. There are great presentations by Climate Reality and books and other things that I'll mention to give you more detail about the climate crisis, but that is something that um, often impacts and underpins some of these other issues that I'll be talking about, such as extreme weather events. We know that Things like drought, floods, heat waves, and hurricanes, and sea level rise are all significantly impacted by our changing climate. And as a result, we're going to unfortunately see more wildfires, see more heat waves and issues related to that that are going to impact many different people, but especially those who already have limited resources um, available to them in the community. 
Food deserts is another environmental issue that uh, can be related to the natural environment, but is more of a built environment issue. This is the idea that populations often in urban areas, often low income, often filled with a lot of individuals of color, don't have access to inexpensive, healthy food options. The only option is the McDonald's or the gas station to be able to get you know, chips and other things like that. And so uh, there's this gap in healthy and affordable food options, which certainly has major health implications. We know toxic waste is a major issue. This is an image of Shingle Mountain in Dallas, which is a literal 70 foot um, mountain of ground up roofing shingles and other debris that were illegally dumped and have caused significant health impacts for um, the African-American community living in the surrounding area. And we know there's other toxic waste issues too, right? Oil spills and uh, radioactive waste and, and issues related to that. Pollution, even if it's not toxic, it's still going to create a lot of issues. Plastic pollution in particular is a major, major issue impacting uh, our health, our availability of water and marine life and many other, uh, you know, even taking it further, looking at air pollution and health. So those are just some samples of issues that we're facing. Now, what are some of the impacts? There are significant impacts of climate change specifically and also pollution more broadly on human health. This is a great graphic by the CDC that shows just some of those impacts. Air pollution, changes in vector ecology. A lot of people don't realize that as the climate changes, the um, habitats of mosquitoes and ticks and other critters like that who spread disease changes. And so there are regions that were not originally susceptible to things like malaria or dengue fever or Lyme that are now having to face crises with those. Increasing allergens, impacts to water quality and food supply, again going back to things like food deserts, forced migration, civil conflict, mental health impacts, um, and heat related uh, illness and death. So, uh, and also injuries and fatalities from severe weather events. So these things are all really connected. It's hard to break them apart, but it is going to have a major impact on our physical health as well as our mental health. Just to name a few examples, we know that there's a correlation between increased heat and aggression. Crime actually statistically increases in warmer temperatures. We know that there can be post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of extreme weather events and surviving a tornado or hurricane. And on the other side, we know that there's serious benefits of nature, that spending time in natural environments is therapeutic to our mental health. And so the more we can protect that and harness that and make sure that's available equitably to all people, that's also going to benefit us. There's also economic costs. Just to name a few examples, changes in crop productivity, lower supplies of fresh water, loss of capacity to work because of heat. Think about people who work outdoors, cost of adapting to sea level rise, relocation costs, health and mental health care costs, and more. So it's not just going to impact our health and mental health, but also um, the economics of our whole system, our whole GDP is going to decrease if we don't act on climate change. Who is impacted? Uh, a lot of different people are. Uh, in fact, a recent estimate that the New York Times put out is that over 50% of Americans uh, are going to be living in a habitat that is negative, uh, has negative changes because of climate change. Um, and so we know that it doesn't necessarily discriminate in who it impacts, but in terms of um, impact as well as recovery, there can be disproportionate way pathways that that manifests so often the communities that are already the most disadvantaged or marginalized are then disproportionately impacted by and or might have a harder time recovering from environmental problems this is a great model that i learned at the yale school of public health of looking at vulnerability to climate and environmental issues you have your exposure to what it, extent are you exposed to the problem, like Miami is very exposed to sea level rise, for example. Sensitivity, so I mentioned working with older adults, they're more physiologically susceptible to heat, and so there's increased sensitivity. 
And then adaptive capacity. If a tornado comes through a, a wealthy neighborhood, there's going to be more resources to be able to rebuild than if it hit a low income community that might not have those same opportunities available to them to recover. One example is indigenous communities. So Native Americans and First Nations groups have a lot of wisdom and strength that we can learn from in terms of um, harmonious connection and value for the natural environment. And so I wanna lead with that strength-based perspective, but it's also worth noting the intergenerational trauma that this population has been impacted by because of a number of uh, political and cultural factors, but one of those factors is the loss of sacred ancestral tribal lands. This graph here shows basically all the land that was uh, populate, populated by Native communities starting in 1492 up until today, and clearly there's been significant loss of those lands, and that has serious consequences to these communities when you think about grief, ecological grief and spirituality and how it impacts all of that. We're also already seeing our first climate force migrants. I'm not saying climate refugees because a refugee is a legal term that um, refers to someone who has a well-founded fear of persecution on a number of bases such as you know, race, religion, political affiliation, and having climate impacts is not a part of that category. But we are seeing people that are being forced to move uh, because they're losing land due to sea level rise or increasing threats to extreme weather events. This is a photo of Kiribati, which is known by many as the uh, climate migration ground zero and the canary in the coal mine. They've already lost a lot of their land and the president has bought land in Fiji as a plan to relocate most of their inhabitants since much, if not all of the country is projected to be underwater. The same fate is true in other low-lying Pacific and island nations like the Marshall Islands and the Maldives. But it's not just tropical paradises that are turning into these nightmares. It's also um, places that are impacted by increasing heat, like Phoenix, Arizona, my hometown, um, places that are going to be experiencing drought. Uh, and there's significant international conflict implications if you think about how drought has impacted, for example, armed conflict in Yemen and Syria. So serious implications for the stability of our, uh, our neighbors worldwide and for ourselves as well. Older adults are significantly impacted. This is a tragic photo from Hurricane Harvey uh, and flooding to, to a nursing home. Um, because of physiological susceptibility, particularly to extreme heat, they are more vulnerable to these issues uh, and have uh, often limited income, fixed income, and so may have less of that adaptive capacity to be able to handle these changes. But on the other side of the spectrum, it impacts children and families too. For example, children are more susceptible to um, air pollution or sometimes waterborne diseases. But uh, we're seeing youth movements be uh, really rising to the challenge and being a significant part of that call to action and being a part of the solution. I'll also mention here related to mental health, there's a lot of people that are grappling with whether or not it's a uh, ethical thing to do to have children and the implications to our environment and our uh, emissions and things. And so there's just uh, a lot of complexities that people are struggling with when we think about solutions and how that intersects with our um, values and life plans as well. Animals, I gotta mention animals. This is the ubiquitous polar bear on the iceberg image that represents climate change. But while social workers primarily work with humans, there is an increasing focus on animal assisted interventions and our responsibility to not just humans, but the natural world, including plants and animals. And animals are certainly being impacted by uh, climate change as well as loss of habitat from urban sprawl and things like that. So what can we do and what should we do to be a part of the solution? The great thing about social work is that we can work in with a variety of populations in a number of different social issues and using a variety of different skill sets. So whether you are doing case management or therapy, micro work, 
um, you're working more in communities and neighborhoods doing meso work, or you're more of a, a policy or nonprofit leader, there's macro ways that you can get involved too. My first recommendation is to educate yourself. This is just a small, small sampling of some of the books and movies that myself and my students have found particularly helpful. I want to highlight the UN's CC Learn program. It's their Climate Change Learning Partnership. There are free classes online that deal with a lot of things that you will probably find interesting, like gender and how gender discrimination and gender inequalities are exacerbated by climate problems. Looking at health, looking at urban design and cities um, and environmental racism. So there's a number of different uh, things that you can learn there. Of course, I got to plug the Climate Reality Project. You can apply to have comprehensive training to be able to give similar presentations on your own. And there are a lot of different you know, books and resources out there. I would encourage you to be prudent and um, cautious about what you're, you're using and make sure that it's an evidence-based and research-based source. But I would also challenge you to broaden your scope. We often have this confirmation bias where we only read things that are going to confirm what we already believe. And so the more that you can educate yourself about um, different perspectives is going to give you that rounded approach of how uh, you know different Americans and countries are viewing this problem and viewing solutions. Reducing your carbon footprint. We've all heard about how we can save electricity um, by you know, buying an electric uh, vehicle to reduce our emissions or setting our thermostat lower, you know, recycling, all that good stuff. Those individual things that you can do are very important, but larger systematic efforts matter even more. So while I'm still talking about individual efforts, I'm going to move on to talking about clinical social work, but just keep in mind that I'm going to come back to those macro level efforts because that is incredibly important and we need larger scale action because of the, the seriousness and urgency of the problem. If you are a clinical social worker, you can work with individuals who are suffering from eco-anxiety, eco-grief, PTSD as a result from um, extreme weather events. You can incorporate nature-based mindfulness or other eco-therapeutic practices into your clinical practice and help people to cope uh, and thrive by um, overcoming issues related to the natural environment and also utilizing the natural environment as a source of healing. I've come up with this snappy acronym of different ways that we can tackle those psychological issues related to um, eco-grief and eco-anxiety. I call it upstream. And so it stands for uh, you being understanding, understanding that you're not alone and that it makes sense if you're feeling overwhelmed by the scope of the problem and having self-compassion for yourself uh, in the midst of those difficult feelings. Participating in the solution. Often we can help ourselves by helping others, and the more we can be a part of solving the problem, the better it's going to get, and the more we'll feel that sense of um, autonomy and empowerment uh, to be able to, to make action. Self-talk is really important. I'm a big believer in cognitive behavioral therapy, and so ways that we can restructure our thoughts um, and change the way that we're talking to ourselves. There's a lot of tools out there looking at cognitive distortions, and other things like that to be able to change the way you're thinking um, to be more helpful and positive. Healing trauma, recognizing that for many people, environmental um, experiences can be traumatic, whether that's surviving um, a, a wildfire or just dealing with um, the helplessness that comes from feeling like there are negative things going on in our world related to the climate crisis. There are tools, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to get into, but to um, help to heal that trauma and seek safety. Reducing isolation. Many studies show that the number one thing that impacts our happiness is the quality of our interpersonal relationships. And so connecting with others um, that are like-minded, but also just connecting with others that are gonna have, make you laugh and have fun um, and give you that support. Incorporating ecotherapy, um, nature-based mindfulness and other solutions like that, getting out and finding that healing power of nature. 
acts of self-care. This is the behavioral element. So what are you doing to care for yourself, whether that be exercise, sleep, nutrition, um, any of those activities that help your health and well-being and make you feel happy and fulfilled are important. I would say um, the the classic example with self-care is like on an airplane, you must put your own oxygen mask on first before assisting other passengers. And the same is true for people in helping professions. You need to be able to care for yourself and come from that place of wholeness before you can effectively serve others. And finally, having mindfulness that doesn't just have to be out in nature, but that present you know, non-judgmental awareness of this moment. And that's increasingly important as our world is becoming more virtual, you know, staying present and mindful um, and focusing on the now and what you can do in the now rather than worrying about the future or stressing about the past. Moving to larger scale efforts, community organizing is incredibly important. It's become uh, very popular among social workers to work with community gardens to uh, have a number of benefits, including solving food deserts. And so uh, the key here is partnership and collaboration and empowerment. We aren't riding in on a white horse saving a community, but rather we are leveraging the strengths and wisdom that already exists in that community to boost the results and help work together to come up with ways to uh, assess the problem in the community and come up with and implement solutions. Advocacy is also incredibly important. This doesn't mean that you have to go to a rally and hold a sign, although if that's what you wanna do, more power to you. Uh, but advocacy on behalf of an individual client, maybe you're a home health worker and you see that there is a neighborhood near a concrete batch plant that is having uh, health issues you know, related to, to breathing, COPD and that kind of thing. How can you determine if there are uh, environmental issues impacting that and what to do about it? Advocating on a larger scale um, by contacting elected officials or um, changing you know, policies. And so we can certainly all get out and vote about the issues that matter most to us. Um, but social workers are in a great position to use their practice experience to inform policy um, and, and show you know, what evidence-based practices work and what are those big scale uh, interventions that come to the root of the problem rather than just the symptoms. You can conduct research. There is this a very growing field of green social work and there are some great resources out there, but there aren't enough. And so if you are interested in um, pursuing a PhD or you already have uh, a doctoral degree or just want to get involved in research, you can determine what issues are in your community, what are evidence-based practices for addressing that, and how can we disseminate that information to the public and to social work practitioners and scholars. You can teach others. Now, you don't have to be a professor like me to be able to teach others. You can talk about it with your friends, share, the, share this information with your colleagues. Um, but if you're in a position where you are educating others, incorporating this information into social work curriculum is incredibly important and moving just beyond that social environment and seeing how the physical environment and climate change in particular are impacting these issues and why it's relevant for social workers. Here's a little sneak peek of the course that I designed. Um, it has at its center a comprehensive environmental justice project, which involves students identifying an environmental issue and how that issue impacts a vulnerable population. And then coming up with specific policy and practice recommendations for solving that issue. And finally, putting that into practice, doing something about it, actually going out and serving um, or lobbying or whatever that looks like to help make that change happen. It's also a fully open education resource course. So um, everything is online, no carbon footprint from a book and more equitable for students to access. Um, and that is at uh, the University of Texas at Arlington. I want to leave you with a couple in quotes. This one is saying that we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is time for vigorous and positive action. And that's the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
Climate Reality Project says we must, we can, and we will solve the climate crisis. I have uh, just some of the references that I used in creating this presentation, but welcome any questions that you might have. This is uh, my personal email, and I just encourage you to use your expertise, use the area that you're already working um, to be able to incorporate this important uh, aspect into your social work practice. Thank you so much.